the dweller of the dark. We are a channel honoring the yellowed, blackened bones of many prominent authors. We will be digging up several obscure, strange, and forgotten authors who influenced many of the great horror, science fiction, and fantasy writers today. Comment below if you like. If you have authors that you'd like to see recognized, list them in the comments or contact our author page. Authors always looking for fresh blood. Subscribe and contact us for more information. Subscribe for more tales of the horrifying, obscure, strange, and forgotten. We'll have quite a collection climbing out of the tombs. If you like any of our tales, crush or cut the like button below. Check out our other stores and our websites. Links are listed below. Rumble, BitChute, YouTube, Dweller of the Dark. WordPress, official Dweller of the Dark website. Check out our current creepers on the website. Books are on Amazon and Kindle. You can find us on Facebook at Jeffrey LeBlanc Horror Writer. Follow us, support us on Parlor, Instagram, Twitter, Patreon, and Bandcamp. Dweller of the Dark. Children of Horror. A terrified son tries to save his hypnotized father from the god Anubis. In New Orleans, a disillusioned writer attends the Mardi Gras and dinner with the Egyptian god Sebek. And an archaeologist takes a pyramid tour with the evil god Nefren Ka. As we continue to decipher and dig our way through a series of Egyptian tales from Robert Block. The Egyptian gods hope you won't climb the walls with our latest weird tales. Our fifth episode is Fane of the Black Pharaoh. Our horrific story was published in the December 1937 issue of Weird Tales by our resurrected mummy, Robert Block. Our dark master commands you to dig deeper through his Egyptian series. The creeping introduction of Fane of the Black Pharaoh as stated by Weird Tales says, Those eyes shone through the shadows, unwinking, unchanging, omniscient in this little world of the dead. But Robert Block's introduction brought more blood and fang. Terrible was the fame of Nefren Ka, and more terrible still was the destiny that Captain Carteret read on the walls of the red litten underground corridors. Our story concerns Captain Carteret and his exploration to an unknown hieroglyphic wall beneath the pyramids of Egypt. The hieroglyphics are in the forbidden catacomb of Nefren Ka. Captain Carteret's guide may or may not be all he claims to be. What is the prophetic secret of the Black Pharaoh? Can our Captain Carteret decipher the wall in time to fulfill his destiny? Fane of the Black Pharaoh by Robert Block. Terrible was the fame of Nefren Ka, and more terrible still was the destiny that Captain Carteret read on the walls of the red litten underground corridors. Liar, said Captain Carteret. The dark man did not move, but beneath the shadows of his burnoose, a scowl slithered across a contorted countenance. But when he stepped forward into the lamplight, he smiled. That is a harsh epithet, Effendi, purred the dark man. Captain Carteret stared at his midnight visitor with quizzical appraisal. A deserved one, I think, he observed. Consider the facts. 
You come to my door at midnight, uninvited and unknown. You tell me some long rigmarole about secret vaults below Cairo, and then voluntarily offer to lead me there? That is correct, assented the Arab blandly. He met the glance of the scholarly captain calmly. Why should you do this? pursued Carteret. If your story is true, and you do possess so manifestly absurd a secret, why should you come to me? Why not claim the glory of discovery yourself? I told you, Effendi, said the Arab, that is against the law of our brotherhood. It is not written that I should do so. And knowing of your interest in these things, I came to offer you the privilege. You came to pump me for my information, no doubt. That's what you mean, retorted the captain acidly. You beggars have some devilishly clever ways of getting underground information, don't you? So far as I know, you're here to find out how much I've already learned, so that you and your fanatic thugs can knife me if I know too much. Ah! The dark stranger suddenly leaned forward and peered into the white man's face. Then you admit that what I tell you is not wholly strange. You do know something of this place already. Suppose I do, said the captain, unflinching. That doesn't prove that you're a philanthropic guide to what I'm seeking. More likely, you want to pump me, as I said, then dispose of me and get the goods for yourself. No, your story is too thin. Why, you haven't even told me your name. My name? The Arab smiled. That does not matter. What does matter is your distrust of me. But since you have admitted at last that you do know about the crypt of Nefrenka. Perhaps I can show you something that may prove my own knowledge. He thrust a lean hand under his robe and drew forth a curious object of dull, black metal. This he flung casually on the table so that it lay in a fan of lamplight. Captain Carteret bent forward and peered at the queer metallic thing. His thin, usually pale face now glowed with unconcealed excitement. He grasped the black object with twitching fingers. The seal of Nefren Ka, he whispered. When he raised his eyes to the inscrutable Arabs once more, they shone with mingled incredulity and belief. It's true, then. What you say, the captain breathed. You could obtain this only from the secret place, the place of the blind apes, where Nefren Ka bindeth up the threads of truth. The smiling Arab finished the quotation for him. You, too, have read the Necronomicon, then? Carteret looked stunned. But there are only six complete versions and I thought the nearest was in the British Museum. The Arab's smile broadened. My fellow countryman, Al Hasred, left many legacies among his own people, he said softly. There is wisdom available to all who know where to seek it. For a moment, there was silence in the room. Carteret gazed at the black seal and the Arab scrutinized him in turn. The thoughts of both were far away. At last the thin, elderly white man looked up with a quick grimace of determination. I believe your story, he said. Lead me. The Arab, with a satisfied shrug, took a chair, unbidden, at the side of his host. From that moment, 
he assumed complete psychic mastery of the situation. First, you must tell me what you know, he commanded. Then I shall reveal the rest. Carteret, unconscious of the other's dominance, complied. He told the stranger his story in an abstracted manner while his eyes never swerved from the cryptic black amulet on the table. It was almost as though he were hypnotized by the queer talisman. The Arab said nothing, though there was a gay gloating in his fanatical eyes. Two. Carteret spoke of his youth of his wartime service in Egypt and subsequent station in Mesopotamia. It was here that the captain had first become interested in archaeology and the shadowy realms of the occult which surround it. From the vast desert of Arabia had come intriguing tales as old as time, furtive fables of mystic Iron, city of ancient dread, and the lost legends of vanished empires. He had spoken to the dreaming dervishes whose hashish visions revealed secrets of forgotten days and had explored certain reputable ghoul-ridden tombs and burrows in the ruins of an older Damascus than recorded history knows. In time, his retirement had brought him to Egypt. Here in Cairo, there was access to still more secret lore. Egypt land of lurid curses and lost kings has ever harbored mad myths in its age-old shadows. Carteret had learned of priests and pharaohs, of olden oracles, forgotten sphinxes, fabulous pyramids, titanic tombs. Civilization was but a cobwebbed surface upon the sleeping face of eternal mystery. Here, Beneath the inscrutable shadows of the pyramids, the old gods still stalked in the old ways. The ghost of Set, Ra, Osiris, and Bubastis lurked in desert ways. Horus, Isis, and Sebek yet dwelt in the ruins of Thebes and Memphis, or bided in the crumbling tombs below the valley of kings. Nowhere had the past survived as it did in ageless Egypt. With every mummy, the Egyptologist uncovered a curse. The solving of each ancient secret really uncovered a deeper, more perplexing riddle. Who built the pylons of the temples? Why did the old kings rear the pyramids. How did they work such marvels? Were their curses potent still? Where vanished the priests of Egypt? These and a thousand other unanswered questions intrigued the mind of Captain Carteret. In his newfound leisure he read and studied, talked with scientists and savants. Ever the quest of primal knowledge beckoned him on to blacker brinks. He could slake his thirsty soul only in stranger secrets, more dangerous discoveries. Many of the reputable authorities he knew were open in their confessed opinion that it was not well for meddlers to pry too deeply beneath the surface. Curses had come true puzzling promptness, and warning prophecies had been fulfilled with a vengeance. It was not good to profane the shrines of the old dark gods who still dwelt within the land. But the terrible lure of the forgotten and the forbidden was a pulsing virus in Carteret's blood. When he heard the legend of Nephren Ka, he naturally investigated. Nephren Ka, according to authoritative knowledge, was merely a mythical figure 
He was purported to have been a pharaoh of no known dynasty, a priestly usurper of the throne. The most common fables placed his reign in almost biblical times. He was said to have been the last and greatest of that Egyptian cult of priest sorcerers who for a time transformed the recognized religion into a dark and terrible thing. This cult, led by the arch hierophants of Bubastus, Anubis, and Sebek, viewed their gods as the representatives of actual hidden beings, monstrous beast men who shambled on earth in primal days. They accorded worship to the Elder One, who is known to myth as Nyala Hotep, the mighty messenger. This abominable deity was said to confer wizard's power upon receiving human sacrifices. And while the evil priests reigned supreme, they temporarily transformed the religion of Egypt into a bloody shambles. With anthropomancy and necrophilism, they sought terrible boons from their demons. The tale goes that Nefren Ka, on the throne, renounced all religion save that of Nyala Hotep. He sought the power of prophecy and built temples to the blind ape of truth. His utterly atrocious sacrifices at length provoked a revolt, and it is said that the infamous pharaoh was at last dethroned. According to this account, the new ruler and his people immediately destroyed all vestiges of the former reign, demolished all temples and idols of Nyala Hotep, and drove out the wicked priests who prostituted their faith to the carnivorous Bubastus Anubis and Sebek. The Book of the Dead was then amended so that all references to the pharaoh Nefren Ka and his accursed cults were deleted. Thus, argues the legend, the furtive faith was lost to reputable history. As to Nefren Ka himself, a strange account is given of his end. The story ran that the dethroned pharaoh fled to a spot adjacent to what is now the modern city of Cairo. Here, it was his intention to embark with his remaining followers for a westward isle. Historians believe that this isle was Britain, where some of the fleeing priests of Bubastus actually settled. But the pharaoh was attacked and surrounded, his escape blocked. It was then that he had constructed a secret underground tomb in which he caused himself and his followers to be interred alive. With him in this vivid sepulture, he took all his treasure and magical secrets so that nothing would remain for his enemies to profit by. So cleverly did his remaining devotees contrive this secret crypt that the attackers were never able to discover the resting place of the Black Pharaoh. Thus, the legend rests. According to common currency, the fable was handed down by the few remaining priests who actually stayed on the surface to seal the secret place. They and their descendants were believed to have perpetuated the story and the old faith of evil. Following up this exceedingly unusual story, Carteret delved into the old tomes of the time. During a trip to London, he was fortunate enough to be allowed an inspection of the unhallowed and archaic Necronomicon of Abdul al-Hazred. In it were further emendations. One of his influential friends in the home office, hearing of his interest, managed to obtain for him a portion of Ludwig Prenn's evil and blasphemous Divermis Mysteries, known more familiarly 
to students of recondite arcana as mysteries of the worm. Here, in that greatly disputed chapter on Oriental myth entitled Saracenic Rituals, Carteret found still more concrete elaborations of the Nefren Ka tale. Prin, who consorted with the medieval seers and prophets of Saracen times in Egypt, gave a good deal of prominence to the whispered hints of Alexandrian necromancers and adepts. They knew the story of Nefren Ka and alluded to him as the Black Pharaoh. Prin's account of the Pharaoh's death was much more elaborate. He claimed that the secret tomb lay directly beneath Cairo itself and professed to believe that it had been opened and reached. He hinted at the cult survival mentioned in the popular tales, spoke of a renegade group of descendants whose priestly ancestors had interred the rest alive. They were said to perpetuate the evil faith and to act as guardians of the dead Nefren Ka and his buried brethren, lest some interloper discover and violate his resting place in the crypt. After the regular cycle of 7,000 years, the Black Pharaoh and his band would then arise once more and restore the dark glory of the ancient faith. The crypt itself if Prin is to be believed, was a most unusual place. Nefren Ka's servants and slaves had builded him a mighty sepulchre, and the burrows were filled with the rich treasures of his reign. All of the sacred images were there, and the jeweled books of esoteric wisdom reposed within. Most peculiarly, did the account dwell on Nefren Ka's search for the truth and the power of prophecy. It was said that before he died down in the darkness, he conjured up the earthly image of Nyalahotep in a final gigantic sacrifice and that the God granted him his desires. Nefren Ka had stood before the images of the blind ape of truth and received the gift of divination over the gory bodies of a hundred willing victims. Then, in nightmare manner, Prin recounts that the entombed Pharaoh wandered among his dead companions and inscribed on the twisted walls of his tomb the secrets of the future. In pictures and ideographs he wrote the history of days to come, reveling in omniscient knowledge till the end. He scrawled the destinies of kings to come, painted the triumphs and the dooms of unborn empires. Then, as the blackness of death shrouded his sight, and palsy wrenched the brush from his fingers, he betook himself in peace to his sarcophagus and there died. So said Ludwig Brin, he that consorted with ancient seers. Nefren Ka lay in his buried burrows, guarded by the priestly cult that still survived on earth and further protected by enchantments in his tomb below. He had fulfilled his desires at the end he had known truth and written the lore of the future on the nighted walls of his own catacomb. Carteret had read all this with conflicting emotions. How he would like to find that tomb if it existed. What a sensation he would revolutionize anthropology, ethnology course. The legend had its absurd points. Carteret, for all his research, was not superstitious. He didn't believe the bogus balderdash about Nyalahotep, 
the blind ape of truth or the priestly cult that part about the gift of prophecy was sheer drivel such things were commonplace there were many savants who had attempted to prove that the pyramids in their geometrical construction were archaeological and architectural prophecies of days to come with elaborate and convincing skill they attempted to show that symbolically interpreted the great tombs held the key to history that they allegorically foretold the middle ages the renaissance the great war this Carteret believed was rubbish and the utterly absurd notion that a dying fanatic had been gifted with prophetic power and scrawled the future history of the world on his tomb as a last gesture before death, that was impossible to swallow. Nevertheless, despite his skeptical attitude, Captain Carteret wanted to find the tomb, if it existed. He had returned to Egypt with that intention and immediately set to work. So far, he had a number of clues and hints. If the machinery of his investigation did not collapse, it was now only a matter of days before he would discover the actual entrance to the spot itself. Then he intended to enlist proper governmental aid and make his discovery public to all. This much he now told the silent Arab who had come out of the night with a strange proposal and a weird credential. The seal of the Black Pharaoh, Nefren Ka. Three. When Carteret finished his summary, he glanced at the dark stranger in interrogation. What next? He asked. Follow me, said the other urbanely. I shall lead you to the spot you seek. Now? gasped Carteret. The other nodded. But it's too sudden. I mean, the whole thing is like a dream. You come out of the night, unbidden and unknown. Show me the seal and graciously offer to grant me my desires. Why? It doesn't make sense. This makes sense. The grave Arab indicated the black seal. Yes, admitted Carteret. But how can I trust you? Why must I go now? Wouldn't it be wiser to wait and get the proper authorities behind us? Won't there be need of excavation? Aren't there necessary instruments to take? No. The other spread his palms upward. Just come. Look here. Carteret's suspicion crystallized in his sharp tones. How do I know this isn't a trap? Why should you come to me this way? Who the devil are you? Patience. The dark man smiled. I shall explain all. I have listened to your accounts of the legend with great interest. And while your facts are clear, your own view of them is mistaken. The legend you have learned of is true. All of it. Nefren Ka did write the future on the walls of his tomb when he died. He did possess the power of divination, and the priest who buried him formed a cult, which did survive. Yes, Carteret was impressed, despite himself. I am one of those priests. The words stabbed like swords in the white man's brain. Do not look so shocked. It is the truth. I am a descendant of the original cult of Nefren Ka, 
one of those inner initiates who have kept the legend alive. I worship the power which the black pharaoh received, and I worship the god Nayala Hotep who accorded that power to him. To us believers, the most sacred truth lies in the hieroglyphs inscribed by the divinely gifted Pharaoh before he died. Throughout the ages, we guardian priests have watched history unfold and always it has agreed with the ideographs on those tunneled walls. We believe it is because of our belief that I have sought you out. For within the secret crypt of the Black Pharaoh, it is written upon the walls of the future that you shall descend there. Stunning silence. Do you mean to say, Carteret gasped, that those pictures show me discovering the spot? They do, assented the dark man slowly. That is why I came to you unbidden. You shall come with me and fulfill the prophecy tonight. As it is written, suppose I don't come, flashed Captain Carteret suddenly. What about your prophecy then? The Arab smiled. You'll come, he said. You know that. Carteret realized that it was so. Nothing could keep him away from this amazing discovery. A thought struck him. If this wall really records the details of the future, he began, perhaps you can tell me a little about my own coming history. Will this discovery make me famous? Will I return again to the spot? Is it written that I am to bring the secret of Nefren Ka to light? The dark man looked grave. That I do not know, he admitted. I neglected to tell you something about the walls of truth. My ancestor, he who first descended into the secret spot, after it had been sealed, he who first looked upon the work of prophecy did a needful thing, deeming that such wisdom was not for lesser mortals. He piously covered the walls with concealing tapestry. Thus, none might look upon the future too far. As time passed, the tapestry was drawn back to keep pace with the actual events of history and always they have coincided with the hieroglyphs. Through the ages it has always been the duty of one priest to descend to the secret tomb each day and draw back the tapestry so as to reveal the events of the day that follows. Now during my life that is my mission my fellows devote their time to the needful rites of worship in hidden places. I alone descend the concealed passage daily and draw back the curtain on the walls of truth. When I die, another will take my place. Understand me. The writing does not minutely concern every single event merely those which affect the history and destiny of Egypt itself. Today, my friend, it was revealed that you should descend and enter into the place of your desire. What the moral holds in store for you, I cannot say until the curtain is drawn once more. Carteret sighed. I suppose that there is nothing else left but for me to go, then. His eagerness was ill dissembled. The dark man observed this at once, and 
smiled cynically while he strode to the door. Follow me, he commanded. To Captain Carteret, that walk through the moonlit streets of Cairo was blurred in chaotic dream. His guide led him into labyrinths of looming shadows. They wandered through the twisted native quarters and passed through a maze of unfamiliar alleys and thoroughfares. Carteret strode mechanically at the dark stranger's heels, his thoughts avid for the great triumph to come. He hardly noticed their passage through a dingy courtyard. When his companion drew up before an ancient well and pressed the niche revealing the passage beneath, he followed him as a matter of course. From somewhere, the Arab had produced a flashlight. Its faint beam almost rebounded from the murk of the inky tunnel. Together, they descended a thousand stairs into the ageless and eternal darkness that broods beneath. Like a blind man, Carteret stumbled down, down into the depths of 3,000 vanished years. Four. The temple was entered. The subterranean temple tomb of Nephrin Ka. Through silver gates, the priest passed, his dazed companion following behind. Carteret stood in a vast chamber, the niched walls of which were lined with sarcophagi. They hold the mummies of the interred priest and servants, explained his guide. Strange were the mummy cases of Nephrin Ka's followers, not like those known to Egyptology. The carven covers bore no recognized conventional features as was the usual custom. Instead, they presented the strange, grinning countenances of demons and creatures of fable. Jeweled eyes stared mockingly from the black visages of gargoyles spawned in a sculptor's nightmare. From every side of the room, those eyes shone through the shadows, unwinking, unchanging, omniscient in this little world of the dead. Carteret stirred uneasily, emerald eyes of death, ruby eyes of malvolence, yellow orbs of mockery. Everywhere they confronted him. He was glad when his guide led him forward at last, so that the incongruous rays of the flashlight shone on the entrance beyond. A moment later, his relief was dissipated by the sight of a new horror confronting him at the inner doorway. Two gigantic figures shambled there, guarding either side of the opening. Two monstrous, troglodytic figures. Great gorillas they were, enormous apes carved in simian semblance from black stone. They faced the doorway, squatting on mighty haunches, their huge hairy arms upraised in menace. Their glittering faces were brutally alive. They grinned, bare fanged with idiotic glee, and they were blind, eyeless, and blind. There was a terrible allegory in these figures which Carteret knew only too well. The blind apes were destiny personified, a hulking, mindless destiny whose sightless, stupid gropings trampled on the dreams of men and altered their lives by aimless flailings of purposeless paws. Thus did they control reality. These were the blind apes of truth, according to the ancient legend. The 
symbols of the old gods worshipped by Nefrin Ka. Carteret thought of the myths once more and trembled. If tales were true, Nefrin Ka had offered up that final mighty sacrifice upon the obscene lapse of these evil idols, offered them up to Nyala Hotep and buried the dead in the mummy cases set here in the niches. Then he had gone on to his own sepulchre within. The guide proceeded stolidly past the lumen figures. Carteret, dissembling his dismay, started to follow. For a moment, his feet refused to cross that gruesomely guarded threshold into the room beyond. He stared upward to the eyeless, ogreish faces that leered down from dizzying heights with the feeling that he walked in realms of sheer nightmare. But the huge arms beckoned him on. The unseen faces were convulsed in a smile of mocking invitation. The legends were true. The tomb existed. Would it not be better to turn back now, seek sane aid, and return again to this spot? Besides, what unguessed terror might not lair in the realms beyond? Would horror spawn in the sable shadows of Nefren Ka's inner secret sepulchre? All reason urged him to call out to the strange priest and retreat to safety. But the voice of reason was but a hushed and awe-stricken whisper here in the brooding burrows of the past. This was a realm of ancient shadow where antique evil ruled. Here the incredible was real and there was a potent fascination in fear itself. Carteret knew that he must go on. Curiosity, cupidity, the lust for concealed knowledge, all impelled him, and the blind apes grinned their challenge or command. The priest entered the third chamber, and Carteret followed. Crossing the threshold, he plunged into an abyss of unreality. The room was lighted by braziers set in a thousand stations. Their glow bathed the enormous burrow with fiery luminance. Captain Carteret, his head reeling from the heat and mephitic miasma of the place, was thus able to see the entire extent of this incredible cavern. Seemingly endless, a vast corridor stretched on a downward slant into the earth beyond. A vast corridor, utterly barren, save for the winking red braziers along the walls. Their flaming reflections cast grotesque shadows that glimmered with unnatural life. Carteret felt as though he were gazing on the entrance to Cornetter, the mythical underworld of Egyptian lore. Here we are, said his guide softly. The unexpected sound of a human voice was startling. For some reason, it frightened Carteret more than he cared to admit. He had fallen into a vague acceptance of these scenes as being part of a fantastic dream. Now, the concrete clarity of a spoken word only confirmed an eerie reality. Yes, here they were, in the spot of legend, the place known to Al Hazred, Prin, and all the dark delvers into unhallowed history. The tale of Nefren Ka was true, and if so, what about the rest of this strange priest statements? What about the walls of truth? on which the black pharaoh had recorded the future, had foretold Carteret's own advent 
on the secret spot. As if in answer to these inner whispers, the guide smiled. Gom, Captain Goderet, do you not wish to examine the walls more closely? The captain did not wish to examine the walls. Desperately, he did not. For they, if in existence, would confirm the ghastly horror that gave them being. If they existed, it meant that the whole evil legend was real. That Nefren Ka, Black Pharaoh of Egypt, had indeed sacrificed to the dread dark gods and that they had answered his prayer. Captain Carteret did not greatly wish to believe in such utterly blasphemous abominations as Nayala Hotep. He sparred for time. Where is the tomb of Nefren Ka himself? He asked. Where are the treasure and the ancient books? The guide extended a lean forefinger. At the end of this hall, he exclaimed, peering down the infinity of lighted walls. Carteret indeed fancied that his eyes could detect a dark blur of objects in the dim distance. Let us go there, he said. The guide shrugged. He turned, and his feet moved over the velvet dust. Carteret followed as if drugged. The walls, he thought. I must not look at the walls. The walls of truth. The black pharaoh sold his soul to Nyala Hotep and received the gift of prophecy. Before he died here, he wrote the future of Egypt on the walls. I must not look, lest I believe. I must not know. Red lights glittered on either side, step after step, light after light, glare, gloom, glare, gloom, glare. The lights beckoned, enticed, attracted. Look at us, they commanded. See, dare to see all. Carteret followed his silent conductor. Look, flashed the lights. Carteret's eyes grew glassy. His head throbbed. The gleaming of the lights was mesmeric. They hypnotized with their allure. Look! Would this great hall never end? No. There were thousands of feet to go. Look! Challenged the leaping lights. Red serpent eyes in the underground dark. Eyes of tempters, bringers of black knowledge. Look, wisdom, no, wink the lights. They flamed in Carteret's brain. Why not look? It was so easy. Why fear? Why? His dazed mind repeated the question. Each following flare of fire weakened the question. At last, Carteret looked. Five. Mad minutes passed before he was able to speak. Then he mumbled in a voice audible only to himself. True, he whispered. All true. He stared at the towering wall to his left, limbed in red radiance. It was an interminable Bayou tapestry carved in stone. The drawing was crude in black and white, but it frightened. This was no ordinary Egyptian picture writing. It was not in the fantastic, symbolical style of ordinary hieroglyphics. That was the terrible part. Nefren Ka was a realist. His men looked like men. His buildings were buildings. There was nothing here but a representation of stark reality, and it was dreadful to see. 
for at the point where Carteret first summoned sufficient courage to gaze, he stared at an unmistakable tableau involving crusaders and Saracens. Crusaders of the 13th century, yet Nefren Ka had then been dust for nearly 2,000 years. The pictures were small, yet vivid and distinct. They seemed to flow along quite effortlessly on the wall, one scene blending into another as though they had been drawn in unbroken continuity. It was as though the artist had not stopped once during his work, as though he had untiringly proceeded to cover this gigantic hall in a single supernatural effort. That was it. A single supernatural effort. Carteret could not doubt. Rationalize all he would. It was impossible to believe that these drawings were trumped up by any group of artists. It was one man's work and the unerring, horrid consistency of it. The calculated picturization of the most vital and important phases of Egyptian history could have been set down in such accurate order only by a historical authority or a prophet. Nefren Ka had been given the gift of prophecy and so, as he ruminated in growing dread, Carteret and his guide proceeded. Now that he had looked, a Medusan fascination held the man's eyes to the wall. He walked with history tonight. History and red nightmare. Flaming figures leered from every side. He saw the rise of the Mameluk Empire. Looked on the despots and the tyrants of the East. Not all of what he saw was familiar to Carteret, for history has its forgotten pages. Besides, the scenes changed and varied at almost every step, and it was quite confusing. There was one picture interspersed with an Alexandrian court motif, which depicted a catacomb evidently in some vaults beneath the city. Here were gathered a number of men in robes which bore a curious similarity to those of Carteret's present guide. They were conversing with a tall, white-bearded man whose crudely drawn figure seemed to exude an uncanny aura of black and baleful power. Ludwig Brin, said the guide softly, noting Carteret's stare. He mingled with our priest, you know. For some reason, the depiction of this almost legendary seer stirred Carteret more deeply than any other hitherto revealed terror. The casual inclusion of the infamous sorcerer in the procession of actual history hinted at dire things. It was as though Carteret had read a prosaic biography of Satan in Who's Who. Nevertheless, with a sort of heartsick craving, his eyes continued to search the walls as they walked onward to the still indeterminate end of the long, red illumined chamber in which Nefren Ka was interred. The guide, priest now, for Carteret no longer doubted, proceeded softly but stole covert glances at the white man as he led the way. Captain Carteret walked through a dream. Only the walls were real now, the walls of truth. He saw the Othmans rise and flourish, looked on forgotten battles and unremembered kings. Often there recurred in the sequence a scene depicting the priest of Nefren Ka's own furtive cult. They were shown amidst the disquieting surroundings of catacombs and tombs, engaged in unsavory occupations and revolting pleasures. The camera film of time rolled on. Captain Carteret and his companion walked on, 
Still the walls told their story. There was one small division of the wall which portrayed the priest conducting a man in Elizabethan costume through what seemed to be a pyramid. It was eerie to see the gallant in his finery pictured amidst the ruins of ancient Egypt. And it was very dreadful indeed to almost watch like an unseen observer when a stealthy priest knifed the Englishman in the back as he bent over a mummy case. What now impressed Carteret was the infinitude of detail in each pictured fragment. The features of all the men were almost photographically exact. The drawing while crude, was lifelike and realistic. Even the furniture and background of every scene were correct. There was no doubting the authenticity of it all, and no doubting of the veracity thereby implied. But what was worse, there was no doubting that this work could not have been done by any normal artist, however learned, unless he had seen it all. Nefrenka had seen it all in prophetic vision after his sacrifice to Nayalahotep. Goddard was looking at truths inspired by a demon. On and on to the flame and fane of worship and death at the end of the hall. History progressed as he walked. Now he was looking at a period of Egyptian lore that was almost contemporary. The figure of Napoleon appeared. The Battle of Abu Kir, the massacre of the pyramids, the downfall of the Mameluk horsemen, the entrance to Cairo. Once again, a catacomb with priests and three figures, white men in French military regalia of the period. The priests were leading them into a red room. The Frenchmen were surprised, overcome, slaughtered. It was vaguely familiar. Carteret was recalling what he knew of Napoleon's commission. He had appointed savants and scientists to investigate the tombs and pyramids of the land. The Rosetta Stone had been discovered and other things. Quite likely, the three men shown had blundered onto a mystery the priest of Nefrenka had not wanted to have unveiled. Hence, they had been lured to death as the walls showed. It was quite familiar, but there was another familiarity which Carteret could not place. They moved on, and the years rushed by in panorama. The Turks, the English, Gordon, the plundering of the pyramids, the World War, and ever so often, a picture of the priest of Nefrenka and a strange white man in some catacomb or vault. Always the white man died. It was all familiar. Carteret looked up and saw that he and the priest were very near to the blackness at the end of the great fiery hall. Only a hundred steps or so, in fact. The priest, face hidden in his burnous, was beckoning him on. Carteret looked at the wall. The pictures were almost ended, but no. Just ahead was a great curtain of crimson velvet on a ceiling rack, which ran off into the blackness and reappeared from shadows on the opposite side of the room to cover the wall. The future, explained his guide. The 
Captain Carteret remembered that the priest had told how each day he drew back the curtain a bit so that the future was always revealed just one day ahead. He remembered something else and hastily glanced at the last visible section of the wall of truth next to the curtain. He gasped. It was true. Almost as though gazing into a miniature mirror, he found himself staring into his own face. Line for line, feature for feature, posture for posture, he and the priest of Nefrinka were shown standing together in this red chamber just as they were now. The red chamber. Familiarity. The Elizabethan man with the priest of Nefrinka were in a catacomb when the man was murdered. The French scientists were in a red chamber when they died. Other later Egyptologists had been shown in a red chamber with the priest and they too had been slain. The red chamber. Not familiarity but similarity. They had been in this chamber and now he stood here with a priest of Nefrinka. The others had died because they had known too much. Too much about what? Nefrinka? A terrible suspicion began to formulate into hideous reality. The priests of Nefrinka protected their own. This tomb of their dead leaders was also their fane, their temple. When intruders stumbled onto the secret they lured them down here and killed them lest others learn too much. Had not he come in the same way? The priest stood silent as he gazed at the wall of truth. Midnight, he said softly. I must draw back the curtain to reveal yet another day before we go on. You express the wish, Captain Goderet, to see what the future holds in store for you. Now, that wish shall be granted. With a sweeping gesture, he flung the curtain back along the wall for a foot. Then he moved swiftly. One hand leapt from the Bernus. A gleaming knife flashed through the air, drawing red fire from the lamps, then sank into Carteret's back, drawing redder blood. With a single groan, the white man fell. In his eyes, there was a look of supreme horror, not born of death alone. For as he fell, Captain Carteret read his future in the walls of truth and it confirmed a madness that could not be. As Captain Carteret died, he looked at the picture of his next hours of existence and he saw himself being knifed by the priest of Nefrinka. The priest vanished from the silent tomb just as the last flicker dying eyes showed to Carteret the picture of a still white body, his body, lying in death before the wall of truth. Thank you for listening. Have a great night.